Aloha and welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Jerry Ornalis, a longtime Kamaaina farmer on the island of Hawaii. He is a strong proponent of locally grown produce and egg sustainability on Hawaii. Jerry grew up and ran a dairy in Kapa homesteads and still farms there. Uh, he was also a research technician at the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture. He has been very supportive of the agricultural industry and other farmers and ranchers by serving on the Hawaii Board of Agriculture, Kauai Ag Advisory Committee, uh, the Farm Bureau as an officer on a statewide level and the Kauai level, and the founding member of the East Kauai Water Users Cooperative, among other things. Jerry, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for having me on the show. Please tell us a little more about your background on Kauai and your passion with agriculture. Well, you know, I, I grew up here uh, on the east side of Kauai, and I lived here uh, my entire life and started farming um, in, in high school and uh, ended up running the, uh, the family dairy farm um, here and um, have been a lifelong farmer. I, I'm of that generation that actually had to leave the farm because you know farming became um, um, financially unstable, and you know when I started having a family, um, I had responsibilities and needed to work off of the farm. So I'm of that kind of sort of like that lost generation that left the farm, and then you know worked for the University of Hawaii for a number of years and retired about eleven years ago, and am now back to um, full time farming, which I consider to be my true profession. Yeah. So you you mentioned, you know, like it was hardship at one time. Uh, what's the difference between then and now? Uh, you know, Dennis, I think the, the and I think you saw some of this yourself. The, the golden era of agriculture, as, as I see it, you know, was probably somewhere between 1870 and um, 1970. Uh, and what changed was uh, uh, technology. Right, especially um, uh, containerized cargo. So, and uh, you know what happened around 1970 is, of course, you know tourism came its to its own. So, getting labor for agricultural work uh, was was hard. And uh, I think even your dad and those people of that generation uh, realized that because if you look at when they started the farm bureau here on Kauai. You know, your dad was a charter member and they started in 1968. So I think it was around that time that people started to realize that farming was not what it used to be. Yeah, I remember uh, working in the 50s and 60s as a kid uh, on the farm, you know, that's all we had to do. Uh, we got uh, a lot of issues. Um, you need the land. Plus, water is a big thing. It's uh, with the plantation going out of business. Plantation used to control it. You had good uh, system of irrigation, which is gone when they went out of business. And uh, you guys stepped up. Uh, can you tell us a little about the uh, East Kauai Water Users Co op that you guys founded? Yeah, sure. Um in 2000, um, Lue Plantation uh, Company um, announced that they were go going out of business. So, of course, you know, as farmers and ranchers, we were um, somewhat alarmed as to what was going to happen to the water. And um, like your family property up in uh, Kapahi, we also have a ditch that runs through our farm uh, uh, here in Kapaha Homesteads. And so, you know, being concerned, I uh, recall calling the land agent at DLNR and asking, you know, okay, so what, what becomes uh, of, of the ditch system? Are we still gonna be able to, to access water? And the answer I got was that um, they were in no way obligated to provide us with water. So, uh, you know, we had to take matters into our own hands and we um, got a facilitator over here from Oahu and she was very good at what she did. And we held a community meeting at the middle school in Kapa'a 
And it was attended by about 60 or 70 people. And it was decided then that, you know, we really needed this water. And uh, we, uh, at night, in fact, decided we would form a cooperative. So, um, you know, it took us a year of, of meetings every single Monday, uh, meetings uh, among ourselves, as well as with, you know, just a, a, an incredible number of, of government organizations, everything from county, state, we even had some federal people that we talked to. So the upshot of that was that we formed a, uh, we formed the East Kauai Water Users Cooperative, which was a um, 501C12, the 12 designation being um, uh, specifically dealing with uh, a cooperative that deals with irrigation water. So, you know, we charged uh, a, a small fee of our members. A lot of the work we did was voluntary in maintaining the system. And, um, you know, we did um, go to the legislature, ask for a stipend to help ends meet. Yeah, which leads to, you know, what uh, prompted me to appear about this, because I guess they stopped funding the $75,000 a year about two, three years ago. So um, you guys stopped operating it. And I understand now they have a half a million dollar uh, study on the system, you know, which yeah. meanwhile. Well, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, if I can back up a little bit, Dennis. Um, you know, the reason we went out of business primarily was um, because of the regulatory burden. What happened was um, some of the large entities here in Hawaii, the remnants of the big five, uh, A and B in particular, was uh, drawing a lot of water, uh, even though their farming operations were winding down. And uh, a lot of people felt, a lot of the environmental community felt that, uh, as well as members of the Hawaiian community felt that that wasn't right, that um, they were operating for over 20 years on a revocable permit, as were we, by the way. Um, and that, so they, they, they took it to court. The courts determined that uh, revocable permits were not meant to be open-ended. In other words, there should be a definitive time when the permit ends. So um, what happens was the state told us, well, we are no longer issuing revocable permits. All permits have to become permanent. Well, in order to get a license or a, a lease uh, on a water system, uh, there were several requirements. One of them being an environmental assessment of each watershed in which you operate. And we had multiple watersheds in which we operated our particular system. Uh, you also had to do a um, watershed plan and pay for it. Um, and after you've done that, then it would go out to, to, to auction, to bid. So you could meet those criteria, spend a lot of money doing that and still not be assured of getting a, a lease or a license. So for us, that was uh, just too heavy a burden as a, as a small cooperative of farmers and ranchers. You know, we just didn't have that kind of money. We didn't have um, the legal team to take on a challenge like that. So uh, we decided we would close. And in 2019, uh, we dissolved the co-op. Yeah, that, you know, left a lot of farm. Well, the remaining farmers, you know, without, without the uh, steady water source for their farms in the homestead area, including uh, our family uh, farms which originally, you know, were large tracts, some of them subdivided with both egg dwellings on. But as we know, all the egg dwellings supposed to be in association with farming use on the land. So everybody's supposed to be farming, but there's no irrigation water. Um, so I don't see uh, much farms out there in the, that area. even the, even the cattle need, we had a pretty dry spell recently. It was, pastures were all dry, uh, unless you get a running, there's a ditch, you know, remains of the ditch were at least on paper, but uh, no running water, ditches and the streams running dry. So that's a, that's a big uh, issue with regards to farming, right? The yeah, absolutely, Dennis. And uh, that ditch system that you were on, uh, your family was on, 
uh, it's called a, a farmer's ditch. And in fact, it was specifically designed to provide water to um, non-plantation users. So, um, you know, the plantation did take care of, of, they were actually mandated to by the territorial legislature. When they first went to the legislature during the territorial days, they said, okay, you can build all this elaborate system uh, on government land, a lot of it on government land. And the deal was when you go out of business, it reverts back to um, the territory. Of course, now we're a state, but at the time they said it reverts back to the territory. Right? And, and, and that's what's happened. Uh, in the interim, you know, when they knew they were going to go out of business, um, they stopped maintaining the system, as you know. So a lot of the infrastructure, uh, ditches, flumes, uh, reservoirs, tunnels, are not in very good condition. So, um, yeah, and then as to your other point, very interesting point. Um, you know, when you build a house on agricultural land uh, here in Hawaii, you have to sign a farm dwelling agreement which says in effect that you will farm uh, the property and then you're allowed to build a house on it. Of course, farm dwelling agreement is probably the biggest joke there is because it has never ever been enforced. Right. And that's, uh, I don't, I think they don't know where to start. Although it is on paper, you know, that you gotta do it. And like you said, they, everybody get a sign. Um, but I think you mentioned this before in one of your uh, reports. The, the water, lack of water, is, is no secret, you know. They're breaching reservoirs. The plantation kind of pounded the water. It went in the ground, a lot of groundwater, and now it's kind of going down to the ocean, right? Going that, straight that, to that's the ocean. correct. Yeah, you know, um, you know, um, during its heyday, uh, the plantations and um, Kauai, we didn't irrigate pineapple, but Omaha, we do. And during its heyday, they were drawing statewide, they were drawing 800 million gallons of surface water, in addition to 400 million gallons of groundwater a day. This is an incredible amount of water, and it, it, it speaks to how much water we actually have uh, here in Hawaii. And, um, you know, so we're talking 1.2 billion gallons of water a day. Um, the great majority of the water has now been returned to the streams. And, um, and I would be surprised if for agricultural purposes, we're drawing more than 150 million gallons a day uh, of irrigation water. I would say, you know, I, I'd be surprised 100, 150 to 200 million gallon stops would be my estimate. So uh, what happened to all of that water, right? Well, it's going into the ocean. And another interesting fact, and you may be aware of it um, because you do own property in Puhi. Well, uh, in that particular area, what they call the Puhi Basin or the Kiruhana Basin, uh, when the plantation stopped irrigating, and this has happened elsewhere in the state as well. When the plantations stopped irrigating, and of course, in those days, they did a lot of furrow irrigation, which means they put a tremendous amount of water on the ground. That water was percolating down into the aquifers and recharging them. So in uh, drier areas like uh, in Puhi, we now see some of those um, aquifers uh, in peril, right? Because they're not getting the recharge from the irrigation that they used to. And that's one of the reasons in that area they went to uh, surface water uh, for municipal use. Yeah, that's uh, that is a, a big problem, and I don't think I don't see it getting better anytime soon. Well, right now we got the water that the plantation used to use in the ditches. It's uh, and the plantation did that before they got the uh, hydroelectric plants with a couple of them up Oyahi. and of course they got the tourist water tubing in the ditch mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's being used both for that then for farming I think right now I don't see the mm -hmm. farmers using uh, very much um, so so what do you see uh, agriculture going in the future uh, you know we often get asked the question, 
and it's it's a big issue in Hawaii. And and that question is, can Hawaii feed itself? Uh, you know, my own opinion is absolutely. I mean, we could feed our stuff with one hand tied behind our back, given our water resources, and given the amount of fallow land that we have in Hawaii, we have hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, formerly irrigated land uh, used by the plantations that uh, is now either in pasture, pasture or it's lying fallow. So from a purely te technical standpoint, could we do it? Absolutely. Um, what kind of diet would we have? Mm, maybe kind of a boring diet. Um, there's a lot of things we cannot grow. There's a lot of things we can. Um, so now, would that mean that um, farmers were making a good mm -hmm. livelihood? Not necessarily so. I mean, if we were to feed ourselves, farmers would have to be heavily subsidized because we, 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 it's very hard <laughs> for us to compete with uh, producers on the mainland and in fact now globally. Yeah, we see uh, Costco, a lot of import, and you know, Walmart and other, other stores, a lot of imported uh, fruits and vegetables. Yes. Uh, yeah, we get, well, the land is was sold to the highest bidder, you know, and uh, they're not gonna come here and plant cabbage. Uh, well, yeah. they got they get billionaires raising cattle now, buying out all the cattle and it'll be so I guess it's an industry but it's being like, shipped out, right? That Most that's correct. Cattle, yeah. and, and you know, um there's a lot of blame to go around, including the farmers themselves, <coughs> frankly, frankly. Because you know, um we were very slow as as independent farmers, not the plantations and not the pineapple canners, but the, 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 you know, and you know for yourself because um, you've worked many many, yeah. many 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 years on a farm, um, we were very slow to adopt uh, new technology, right? A lot of our our, our agriculture is based on very labor intensive uh, methods, and you know there's several reasons for that. One of them being uh, the small size of our farms. You know it's difficult to find equipment that matches the scale that we do agriculture on. You know, if we're raising wheat, you can get a combine. They're huge, it takes three acres to turn the thing around, right? That wouldn't work. Um, you know, the scale uh, does not match. Um, so the adoption of technology uh, is gonna play a very important role if we are gonna, um, you know, restore farming to its proper place, which is as an economic driver of our economy. So, um, uh, you know, we really have our work cut out for us. We, we really need to embrace technology and that includes biotechnology, that includes mechanization, that includes uh, 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 post-harvest uh, handling of our products. And, you know, getting back to the issue of feeding ourselves, you know, that may not be the answer. Uh, production for local consumption may not be the answer in Hawaii. Historically, we have exported crops from uh, from Hawaii. So who's to say that? Uh, our future does not lie in export crops. Yeah, we had the, for the sugar and the pineapple, pineapples being canned and exported, right? Uh, and the cattle, you know, is being exported. So right now we got the farmer's market. It's, you know, pretty full. And for example, the one in Pui, pretty full, but uh, I hate to say it, but we don't see it a long time I know locals in the farmer's market. Uh, I don't know if we don't want to work or, you know, granted, they're, they're hard workers, who, you know, those yeah. uh, farmers who are, who've come here and uh, working the land. So it's, uh, I don't know, where do you see it going? I, you know, the, the fundamental problem, okay, is one of uh, profitability, okay? Uh, if farmers can make money, they're going to farm. And you saw, uh, you, you, you saw the tail end of that. Like I said, around 1970, things started to change, but you saw the days, uh, Dennis, when if you bought in a prime crop of watermelon, you could make $20,000, right? which means you could buy two pickup trucks or maybe three in those days, right? So 
Uh, and, and, you know, I've spoken extensively to your dad about that. So he always told me, yeah, when you make the money, save it because it's not going to happen every year. But in those days, it did happen. Farming was pretty much cookbook, right? You planted when you're supposed to, you prepped the field, you did things, buy the book. At the end of the day, you take it down to the wholesaler, you sell the crop, you leave with some money in your pocket, right? That's no longer the case. Now we have to be expert salesmen as well. Right. So uh, as to your reference to farmers markets, um, you know, thank God they came along because that's pretty much all we've got right now. Right. So, so this vertically integrated model of people raising the crop on their farm, taking it down, they're selling it directly to the consumer uh, has saved a lot of farms. Now, the result being that they downsize their farms. If you recall, uh, in the old days, farms were, you know, 20, 20 plus acres in size. You know, was, if you're going to feed a family, you needed 20 or more acres. Now, our average farm size is about five acres and, and sometimes less. There are some large farms, but for the most part, the farmer market guys, they're, they're pretty much in that five acre range. And, um, you know, they're producing all they can sell. The saving grace is that they're getting, uh, uh, you know, retail prices for their product. Yeah, farming farming is not easy. It's uh, I grew up it was in the fifties and sixties with papayas and bananas. The papayas we had the virus uh, by Doctor uh, wiped out a lot of them. Then the government came in with the papaya administrative committee. We couldn't sell certain shape papayas and all that. I mean, I think that went away. Then came the banana the virus. Huh? Yeah. So, yeah. So that that wiped out a lot of the bananas. So it's it's not an easy business. Now for, for and the whole family had to work in it. You know, we had a lot of kids, grandparents, they all had to work in it to make business. Now only one brother is doing it. Um yeah, it's it's not easy. And uh but the government <laughs> I don't know. It's a, a point of debate, but government handing out money, people don't want to work. I guess that goes for all fields, but yeah, I have, I have, um, you know, I have a friend that recruits labor um, uh, down in uh, Micronesia, and you know, he he does all the paperwork. He does it all legally. He does all the paperwork. Gets them here. Plays their paint plane fare gets them here on Kauai to work in his uh, uh, taro patch. Uh, he's a large taro grower and, and um, it houses them, uh, provides transportation, even uh, you know shepherds them through the process of getting a driver's license. He does all of this and they work a year or two and then they leave the farm to work in the landscaping industry or the restaurant industry. So, uh, you know, when we were kids, you and I both, I mean, we didn't have a choice, right? Yeah. We worked on the farm and that was it, right? right? Um, but now you cannot even get, um, uh, you know, people to work on the farm. It's very difficult. You know, there's so many other choices, right? Yeah. So, so what do we do? I think we're going to have to embrace technology. Like I said earlier, you know, I've traveled. Um, I've traveled to Japan several times and I've been to New Zealand. Now, both of those countries have labor issues. So they have really embraced technology, um, especially when it comes to mechanization. So, uh, you know, I was told when, when I was in New Zealand, talking to one of the guys there, one of the farmers there, and he told me, you know, some of the crops you see on grocery store shelves today, will not be there in 10 years if they cannot be mechanized. And this is happening globally. People are moving to the cities. People are becoming utterly mobile. And in some ways, that's a good thing, is that we're erasing poverty. So you cannot find people to work for low wages anymore. But on the other hand, uh, we still need to get the work done. So we're going to have to employ technology to do that. And unfortunately, Hawaii really lags uh, the rest of the nation. We don't even have an engineering, an ag engineering department. Well, I think the department is there, but there's nobody staffing it uh, at, at the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. We don't even have that anymore. So 
um, you know, we've lost that uh, technological edge, and make make it, it makes it very hard for us to compete. Do, do you know what the uh, uh, ag experiment station up in Oilo Homestead is working on, if any? I'm sorry. What's the, what the question? Uh, what, what are they working on right now? At the um, they, doing, you know, um, they're doing work on um, a number of things. I'm not, I'm not working there anymore. So, uh, but I do visit the station occasionally when I need to talk to the extension agents. And I think, um, you know, one of the crops that is showing promise here in Hawaii is uh, cacao, which uh, of course uh, is used to make chocolate. Right. So. I see one of those crops. I see that crop with a lot of potential um, uh, because I think you can apply the pineapple cannery um, uh, um, uh, system to raising that, where whereby you have a lot of individual growers raising the crop for processing in a central location. Yeah, so the farmers would raise pineapple, especially up in your area in, in uh, Kapai, yeah. by the homestead, all the way, all the way to Moloa. They would raise pineapple, but it would be processed and canned at a central cannery. And I remember farmers being happy, Dennis, to get thirty dollars a ton for pineapple. Yeah. I mean, I, I know farmers that sell a sugarloaf, prime sugarloaf pineapple today for thirty dollars, right? Yeah. So, uh, just just to give you an idea, but I, I see that model. Uh, as, as possibly working. And of course, you know, if we did go into it in a big way, this would be an export crop. And I think it dovetails nicely with uh, with tourism, which is something else we as farmers are going to have to embrace. Yeah. I, um, uh, yeah, you just mentioned tourism. Like, is that what they call it? Is that ecotourism or some farm tours? You know, I was, uh, you know, I'm almost school man, and uh, I was actually one of those people that, uh, you know, was kind of leery of of agrotourism, of, of, of you know, oh, just yeah. yeah, this marriage between tourism and agriculture, because well, if you hit your wagon to that star and tourism goes down, then what happens to your farm? But I saw what happened during the pandemic when you know, we survived and bounced back, and now we're back almost to where we were. Uh, if we're not already there. So I think um, because we have to raise specialty crops and niche market type crops, uh, developing uh, what some people refer to as suitcase products, where you raise a product that is, uh, non, not, or is a value added, non-perishable, they can take it with them in their suitcase, right? Um, I, I think there's huge potential for crops like that. And like I pointed out, chocolate fits that bill almost perfectly, but there are other products as well. That, that we could develop. And here again, the more money we spent in research and getting that research, uh, uh, applied research down to the farm level, the more we're gonna benefit. And, and you know, we cannot be cutting the University of Hawaii every time there's a downturn. We cut these two places that the ledge almost inherently cuts. So they, they cut um, the Department of Agriculture funding and they cut funding to the University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. And we need to invest uh, more in both of those entities. Okay. I just want to tell you an interesting story about the experiment station. I believe it was uh, in the 60s, early 60s. My dad sent me up to the Ag Experiment Station. They had uh, come out with the Williams banana. Mm -hmm. Before that was Bluefield. To say to oh go get the KK over there, so they only with thirty five acres. They only gave me six. So <laughs> I had to cut it up to keep multiplying that thing. Yeah, and I know they had tons of them, but that's all they gave me. And uh, yep. we, we multiply that eventually. Uh, yep. This is a side story. Anyway, um, you don't hear too much about the uh, seed corn companies now. How's that going? I think uh, there's a reason you don't hear too much about them. You know, they, they kind of got beat up during the anti-GMO, anti-pesticide, yeah. uh, I, I don't know, I call it hysteria that we had here in Kauai. Other people refer to it differently. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so I think they've taken a more low-key uh, approach. But, you know, there's an industry that, you know, way back, um, 
James Brubaker uh, predicted, and he was a, he was a, a wonderful friend who recently passed away um, uh, here in Hawaii, and, and um, had worked all over the world, literally. Um, and he predicted the, the rise of the seed industry. So these, this is one of our strong suits, yeah? We can grow crops during the, the, the winter months that you cannot grow on the mainland, right? So I do a little bit of that myself on my farm. I have a small uh, winter nursery program, which I work with a California uh, rice farmers cooperative. And I do a small winter nursery for them. So, you know, I've kind of taken a, a page out of the, the seed company's playbook. Because I looked around and I said, hey, who's making money? Well, they are, right? So, you know, um, by doing that, I can, you know, support the rest of my farming habit by um, by raising some seed during the winter months. Yeah. I know you get the lychee and some other fruit trees. How's, the, yeah. how's that wild parrot? Yeah, it's a real problem, man. I mean, we had... Uh, uh, it, it wasn't a really terrific lychee year. The, the problem with lychee is that, you know, we're, we're, we're in the wrong place for lychee. We don't get a cold snap um, during the winter to uh, induce flowering in lychee. So, you know, it's hit and miss as all, everybody who has a lychee tree in the yard knows. Uh, some years you get a good crop, some years you don't. Um, so this year we had, mm, I would say a fair, fair to poor crop, not, not much. And a lot of the fruit was on the top of the tree, but the parent, the uh, rose ring parakeets were, were just uh, ferocious. I mean, I, I, I didn't harvest anything except a little bit for family use because uh, all of it was eaten by the birds. So, I mean, that's just some of the stuff we have to deal with. Yeah, so I guess we'll fall on uh, some government assistance to help with stuff like that, right? The best. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and even uh, talk about pests, kind of go expanding a little bit more. Uh, a while back, state didn't have money; they cut out all the uh, that pest control under the Department of Health. Then, with all the issues with with the pests, uh, yeah. So, yeah. well, all, the, all my complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, getting back to water, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, Big issue. It, so, it's a huge issue, Dennis. Yeah. You know, we're we're out here in the middle of the Pacific, and you know we cannot divert the Colorado River, right? Yeah. Uh, and well, even if we could, there's not much water left in it anyway. So, uh, but yeah, we're out here now. What we've got is what we've got. So yeah. I, I'm I'm concerned about as you as you alluded to earlier earlier about um, the the demise of all of the reservoirs that. that, yeah. that are, in decommission and uh, you know the abandonment of our ditch system do you know for yourself um we would never be able to get permits to build that type of infrastructure right, right. i mean try and get a permit to, to to drill a tunnel through a mountain today can you imagine yeah. uh there's no way yeah i've walked the tunnel from homestead to Hanalei. And anyway, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, you got any last words, uh, Jerry? No, I, I, I um, you know, there's, there's so much to say, so little time. But I, I think the take home message is um, agriculture needs help. We, we are in trouble. And, you know, I spent my life um, trying to, like I said earlier, trying to restore agriculture to its rightful place as an economic driver of our economy. And again, Dennis, thank you for having me on the program. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Mahalo to our guests, Farmer Jerry Ornalis. Mahalo to our viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech free media shows, please help support this nonprofit platform. Aloha, ahui ho, alama pono.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.